Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kim Knoxell. I'm the director of the uh, Center for International Defense Policy here at Queen's. Uh, and on behalf of the Public Administration Program uh, at uh, Royal Military College of Canada uh, and uh, the CIDP, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome um, our team today, um, Ellie Berman uh, and Major General uh, uh, Denny Thompson, Dennis Thompson, um, uh, to, uh, to speak to us. Um, uh, Ellie Berman, Professor Ellie Berman, uh, is the research director for the International Security Studies uh, Program uh, at uh, uh, UC San Diego. Um, he's a professor of economics, but um, uh, I can uh, tell you that unlike the vast majority of other professors of economics, um, uh, Professor Berman actually knows something about the real world. Um, and uh, so, it's a, so it's, a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, to, uh, uh, to, to welcome him. Um, uh, uh, General Thompson, uh, we're welcoming back to uh, the center. Um, he has uh, he's spoken uh, to us before. Um, uh, he is, as uh, many of you know, uh, retired from the Canadian Army after 39 years of service, and service all over the world, um, uh, including uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and uh, most recently, the Multinational Force and Observers in the Sinai from 2014 uh, to 2017. Today, uh, Ellie and uh, Dennis are going to be talking about the data bridge, uh, connecting tactical success with strategic outcomes. And so without any further ado, uh, let me ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Ellie uh, and Dennis today. All right, I'll go sit down here. <laughs> that, thanks, Kim. With that introduction, I, 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 I feel I should tell you something about my purported knowledge of the real world. I should also mention there are other economists here in the room who might want to come after <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> uh, Simone and Uger are here. So it, um, I think the format here is I'm going to speak for 20 minutes, and then um, uh, General Thompson will follow. And after that, uh, we'll take Q&A. Um, but as an economist, I'm, I, I actually like questions. And so um, if you have some questions of clarification, please do. What I'd like to talk about today um, I've titled my part, Cost-Effective International Deployments, Evidence from a Decade of Research. And so what I'm going to make kind of one statement and then run into, I think, two themes. The one statement is that I'm going to argue that the international community, by which I mean members of NATO, certainly the United States and Canada, are accumulating interventions at, uh, and that that's not going to stop. So deployments abroad are going to be a continuing drama. And if anything, the number of those deployments is going to increase over time just because of the way the geopolitics are working. Um, the, the, the major theme, though, is that um, the doctrines that you all are armed with, or the, the folks that get deployed are armed with, um, to go fix these problems um, are, have really shown themselves as being dated and needing some updating. And so I'm going to give you two examples. One of those is the counterinsurgency doctrine, which is uh, something that certainly General Thompson is an expert on now. Um, and the other is the doctrine of how we work with local allies in a situation like Afghanistan, for instance, in which there's a local ally, so it, it situation in which the, you know, the large power, NATO, doesn't want to out and out invade a country in order to stop it from generating what economists would call bad externalities and what everybody else calls human trafficking, terrorism, narcotics to the neighbors and to the rest of the world. Um, but that's a very expensive proposition, um, the out and out invasion. 
And so the solution that we usually go for is let's empower a local ally with some development assistance and some training to control this problem for us. And what I want to point out is that at least the Pentagon's doctrine on that seems to be flawed and um, some suggestions about how we could fix that. Now everything that I'm going to do, and here's my second theme, is informed by ongoing research projects, projects that we've been doing for a decade now, which are very much data-based. Now, um, along the way, it's not just that the military establishment um, or the defense establishment has doctrines that are dated. The academics, my team, are also need some updating in how we draw inference from the type of data that can possibly come from these type of interventions. And I want to show you some examples of how we're changing the way in which we do inference, including the things that we teach graduate students to do, um, in order to keep up with the type of challenge and the type of data that we've got coming. So um, one assertion, we're accumulating interventions, and then two themes, one about how the security establishment has to kind of update its thinking, and the other about how the research community has to update its thinking. And I'm going to try to go reasonably quick, though there's no clock on the wall. Um, accumulating interventions. And so there's no clock on the wall, so someone else, Kim, will, will apply discipline. So this is the history of US NATO military, interven uh, military interventions. Um, these are new interventions running back to 1975 through 2005. If we updated this, we would see a line that keeps kind of jumping up and down. This is the accumulation of those things. So this is the entrance rate. The exit rate is lower. Hmm. And so what we're getting is accumulations, okay? If you think about exit rates for a moment, then it's hard to know exactly, but the half-life of a subnational conflict, whether we intervene or don't intervene, the half-life is now something like seven or eight years. So that is to say, best guess as to how a conflict a subnational conflict like Syria or Libya might go, well, the rule of thumb is you double how long it's been going so far. That's because that's what the best we could do. So we would say those things are lasting on average for about a decade and a half. So the entrance rate is ongoing, right? The exit rate, if anything, is dropping. And so we're seeing an accumulation of dramas, horrific dramas like Syria, Libya, and this is something we were just talking about uh, before we started. It's, uh, it seems to be a fact of the post-Cold War world that the, large, the great powers don't want to intervene anymore. And we're more isolationist than we used to be, and so little fires don't get put out, and sometimes they just burn and burn and burn, and they become bigger, bigger fires. And so what that means for security forces, um, like the Canadian, is that there are going to be more interventions over time. Now, we could debate this if you like, but it's not the main point I want to make today. Our reaction as researchers has been to try to get, as, as economists and political scientists, is to try to start accumulating evidence on how these interventions work as really a separate part of the study of international relations and economics. Why? Well, in international relations, this just keeps happening more and more, that there are places that are relatively unstable, unstable enough that um, they invite us to intervene or that we have, some we have some interest in intervening. Not because we want to be neo-colonialists, just because bad things are happening and they're leaking into our countries or they're leaking into the neighbors or we're invited. Now, that's kind of the international relations, say, security motivation. There's also an important economic motivation here, which is that um, as the places that are stable graduate out of poverty, China, Indonesia, India, what we find is that the places that have stalled in terms of their economic development are all the places that are not well governed. So the World Bank's estimate, so you I mean, I was at DIF, DIFID, the, the British version of CETA, a few years ago when I gave a talk, something like this talk, and um, they said, oh yes, professor, we have a list of countries that we intervene in, and all the ones that are getting our attention 
um, that are well governed are just graduating out of a need for our assistance. So Indonesia, China, India, we're not going to be there soon, right? The places that are left for the British, for the Americans, for Canada as well, um, those are the places that are badly governed. And there, income per capita has often stagnated and quality of life, if anything, is actually getting worse. So the World Bank's estimate is that by 2025, half of the poor people in the world will live in what they call fragile states. That's 1.5 billion people will be living in places that are just either not well governed as a country, places like Syria, or in corners of countries that are otherwise well governed, like India, but in, in, but in, the, in a periphery where the, where, the, where the doesn't have full government and where bandits and rebels and other folks are kind of controlling things. What in Canada we used to call a territory, right? But, um, but in India is part of a state. And so as, as development economists and as people in, interested in international relations, certainly people interested in, interested in security, we are taking much more of an interest in these places. And so we've gone out and studied things. The places we've studied the hardest and the most are places where the United, the United States has intervened, Iraq, Afghanistan. But we also have a lot of evidence from places like Colombia and Mexico and Egypt and Yemen, all kinds of places. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, what we found were two things that I want to point out. One is that the development assistance often did not do what we thought it was going to. There was a doctrine that said that, well, if you give people development assistance, surely they'll be um, better behaved and they'll be less violent. And so here's a graph that just to show a counterexample. This is a program called LGCD, Local Governance and Community Development. This is a USAID program. And what you see here is the level of violence measured as insurgent attacks, and measured every three months and then smoothed. And um, the black line are the places, are districts in Afghanistan that got this intervention. The, the lightish line are the districts that did not get the intervention. And I challenge you to infer from this graph that things got better faster or at all in the places that got the black line, right? It looks like it made no difference at all. And so when they got desperate enough to say, gee, we don't know if the doctrine's working, the AID folks and the folks at ISAF, at the NATO Afghanistan, they were, in, they were so desperate they called in the economists, academic economists for help. This is a, kind of a nadir in Western civilization, right? When, you, when it gets that bad. But they called in me and my friends and my team. And, um, and, this is, and they, they allowed us to see the data. And this is what we found. We found both in Iraq and in Afghanistan that even though the generals in the capital and the ambassadors and the State Department folks um, saw one big conflict, what we saw was that every district was different. It's the kind of the version of all politics is local. Every battalion is fighting a different set of battles. Right? And so while people think of the Iraq war as things got really bad and then there was a surge and then things got better, <coughs> right? And, and if you read any, most of the think tank stuff and, and the, the big picture stuff, that's what they'll say. Well, you know, Al Muqtadiyah looks a little like that, but Al Dawur doesn't, Al Hamdaniya doesn't, and Kifri doesn't, Tarmia, it different things happen in different places which means that what the battalion does and what the local development folk do and what the deal you make with the local leaders does make a difference. Okay. So that's interesting because that means that we can use all this data to try to figure out what made a difference. Out of that came this. This is kind of how an economist or a rational choice informed political scientist would think about counterinsurgency. So in the way that um, I think most cadets are taught to think about conflict is there are two sides and they shoot at each other and the one with the more equipment and the better tactics wins, 
This is very different. Here, there are three players that matter. This third one is a civilian population. The civilians are the key to winning. Why? Because the civilians hold information which, if fed to the strong side, the one with the drones and the helicopters and the artillery, that information will allow it to beat the rebels. Why does that? Well, because the rebel tactics have to do with roadside bombs and ambushes. That's a very cost-effective way of holding off a Western power or the allies of a Western power. But um, you can't do roadside bombs and ambushes without sharing a little information, making noise. Or, or without, if the roadside bomb's there and you want it to attack the patrol, you don't want it to explode beside the kids going to school or the farmer bringing his stuff to market, then, then you have to tell the civilians where it is. The rebels have to do that. If they don't, it'll kill civilians, and then the rebels will, rat out, will be routed out to the government. And so then the, the civilians, some, a mom sitting at the edge of a bed in the middle of the night in Kandahar who's heard some rustling outside, um, has to decide whether she wants to call in a tip. And this is an amazing thing about the 21st century. That mom has a phone. If she wants to call in a tip or not, and she makes a decision, and it looks like it's a rational decision, she tries to decide who she would prefer running her neighborhood, the rebels or the government. The government provides all services. The rebels also provide services. If you make a deal with the government and the government then retreats, then you're going to be left with the rebels and they're going to be angry about it. So that, it's, a very, it's not an easy decision and it's consequential. If the government can convince the mom to share the information, then they can win the territory, at least for a while. At least until information flow stops. That's the, the, the in a nutshell, um, the, uh, an approach to understanding counterinsurgency. Now that's just a theory. To support it, to test it, you would need data. So this is the, <laughs> Kim, this is the sense in which I'm in touch with reality. There is data. And what we can show is that if you can convince the mom that you're going to give her a development program and that that development program is conditional on her providing information, then she will feed the information and that will reduce violence. And what we know is that programs that were run in a way that was explicitly conditional, the Commander's Emergency Response Program is a, USA, is a, is a uh, US military program um, which, uh, and what this, the slope of this, these are, these are, this is violence, this is money spent, uh, negative slope means more money spent is violence reduction. That's this line. If that, if there's a provincial reconstruction team, that is to say, which means that that money spent is informed by someone who's an expert <coughs> on development as opposed to just throwing the money around, then that violence reduction is steeper. All consistent with the theory that says if you're doing the things that the mom sees benefit in, then she calls in the tip. Other programs, the vast majority of spending, this is in Iraq. The vast majority of the spending is not violence reducing because it wasn't done in that way. They built stuff and the rebels came and blow, blew it up. Sometimes it actually seems to be violence increasing when it was large scale projects. Okay. Now I've got lots and lots of slides of evidence that that theory that I just showed you kind of works, but there's something else I want to tell you. So let me switch you to number two in my theme. So the one thing that needed updating was the doctrine of how counterinsurgency is done and how economics fits, how development assistance fits in a counterinsurgency program. And there's more evidence in there about not causing civilian casualties, about making sure there's cell phone coverage so she can call in the tip, all kinds of stuff like that. Let me take you to, to, to the second problem, which is how you engage a local ally in a way that makes them effective. And the problem is this. The local allies say the Maliki government in Iraq, right? So the Maliki government was given as far as I think the Pentagon was concerned, as far as the State Department was concerned, as far as the White House was concerned, certainly all the assistance and expertise and training that it needed to control Iraq right up to the international border. 
including a lot of a, a lot of blood and casualties that came from foreign forces, including from this country. And so, um, and those achieved this remarkable thing, the turn at Anbar, in which the Sunni rebels stopped rebelling. But then the international forces pulled out, and it turned out that the Iraqi government really wasn't that interested in governing Anbar. Al Qaeda Iraq came back as ISIS. ISIS spread itself into Syria. A civil war ensued. Refugee flows in the millions. Uh, Europe became xenophobic, and now we're discussing Brexit, maybe or maybe not. There's a line between these things, and, but it starts with the Maliki government not doing the thing that we thought that it was, was the deal. And this is the thing about those local allies. They have a cost advantage in suppressing insurgency, narcotics, human trafficking, infectious diseases, because they're there and they're local politicians, but yet they don't really have the same interests that maybe we do in the suppression of those things. And so they cheat. Why do they cheat? Well, they cheat because they take unreserved actions and we don't always provide incentives for them not to cheat. The doctrine that the US, that the Pentagon has been employing up till now in these conflicts is a capacity building doctrine. The local ally comes and says, oh, I could suppress that problem for you if I just had more equipment and more development assistance and more something, and drones would be nice. Um, and, but, but then takes, the, that, takes that, those resources that capability, and if you study case after case, which is what we did in this book over here with my co-author David Lake, nine different cases of a setup like that, the local, starting with, um, starting with South Korea in the 50s and going right up to Iraq, in each one, the local ally says, give me capacity, the, um, the foreign power the US, Israel, there's one example there where it's Germany during the Second World War actually, um, provides capacity building. The local ally, if not incentivized strongly, always does the same thing. It takes that capacity and directs it to its biggest problem, which is not usually the, the biggest problem of the foreigners, which is its local opposition. And so in South Korea, for example, what does the re-government do with the capacity? Well, it aims it at the local opposition, and those folks start disappearing or being arrested or worse. And, um, and the Maliki government does the same thing, right? You train up its special forces, and it goes and directs those special forces at the people that Maliki really thinks are a threat, and they weren't coming from Anbar. Um, and so how to think about this one? Well, here's one schematic. I'll be quick. I know this is an economist thing. If you think of the local ally as an agent in a principal agent relationship where they take some unobserved action and bad things happen anyway, even if they take the action that, that they said they would, then, um, well, economists call this a principal agent problem. There's going to be um, what they call agency slack, which is to say bad things are gonna happen. The ally is going to say, well, uh, I'm sorry. Bad things happen sometimes. It's like the economists call this the babysitter problem, right? I want to go out to a movie with my wife and someone has to watch the kids. Um, we find some teenager who doesn't want to see a movie as badly as I do and is not as rich as me. And we hire the teenager to watch my kids so we can go out and see a movie. And that's efficient because the teenager's time is a little less valuable than mine and I can pay them for their time and all is well. The problem is that I don't observe exactly what the teenager's doing. This is before we you know, had cameras watching everything that happened in my house. And the, 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 the babysitter, and most of the time you come home and everything's fine, but every once in a while you come home and there's like vomit in the corner and there's crayon all over the wall and you say, babysitter, what happened? And the babysitter says, well, oh well, I had this problem that I really couldn't solve. You know, the one-year-old started throwing up and so while I was taking care of the one-year-old, the three-year-old started coloring all over the wall. And 
And you say, well, did, that, did the babysitter really put in full effort? And you don't know, right? The babysitter could have suppressed the problem, or the babysitter could have been sitting on the couch watching Netflix, and the three-year-old could have been you know, feeding the one-year-old candy, right? And until you interrogate the vomit, you're not going to know, right? <laughs> and so same kind of a problem, right? The teenager has plausible deniability. The one-year-old sometimes throws up for no reason, right? And, and has unobserved effort, okay? So in those situations, what do you do? Well, if you model this, then the answer is you build capacity so that the ally will be better at suppression, lower their suppression cost, but you also have to provide rewards and punishments, like no more Netflix for you, right? If you want the local ally to behave as if it has the same interest that you do. Now, that's kind of straightforward. How do you study that? Well, what I showed you a moment ago was how you study when you've got big data. You do standard, you don't even need machine learning, standard econometric technique, the way stuff that we teach to labor economists and all the other applied economists this, these days. Here, to study it, what you need to do is take a whole bunch of case studies, impose exactly the same theory on all of them, make sure everybody's speaking the same language about what's an intervention and what's suppression and what's a reward and what's punishment and what's capacity building, and then study them case by case by case, which is what we did in this volume, which I hope somebody will find interesting. And these are the cases. South Korea, I mentioned. Denmark, this is when Nazi Germany did not occupy Denmark. The Danes were a collaborationist government through most of the war, a collaborating government through most of the war. They were an agent for a foreign power, and they suppressed rebellion, which was aimed at them and at the Germans. Eventually, that relationship fell apart. Why? Well, because the German public is where the, Dan the Danish public realized that the Germans were probably going to lose and became very unhappy with the collaboration of their government. And so um, they started um, not sharing information with the security forces about rebellion. The Danish government was also under pressure from the Allies, who, and they didn't want to end up in a war crimes tribunal where the, the victors were going to judge them. Whole set of places like that. Same model applied to all of them. And what we find is this. This strategy, which is sometimes called indirect control, it can work when principles use rewards and punishments consistently and effectively. It works six out of six times. When principles don't use rewards and punishments effectively, which you see signs of that in all of these cases, episodes, the, the local ally always, always, always cheats, 10 out of 10 times. And so now you say, well, that's not a lot of observations for econometrics or for statistical analysis. That's true. But when you're 10 for 10 and 6 for 6, that's pretty convincing. right? You don't need a lot of large numbers or a central limit theorem. And so you can generate inference. You can learn things even when you've got less than 30 observations to work with, as long as, and even when the data come in a form that's, that's, that's very qualitative. We don't have cardinal measures, we have ordinal measures, they're not comparable across countries. All the inference comes from watching what happens in a particular case over time. And um, now there's some other things that we did in this style of inference, but I've gone over time um, that I'll happily talk about in the question period. But just to wrap it up, I've motivated by asserting that these deployments are going to keep coming. I've given you two examples of where the doctrines are not working. The conventional doctrine needs revising. One on the counterinsurgency doctrine, which um, the other on how we do international assistance. And this includes all assistance, not just military, but also civilian. How does the research help? Well, we've been at this for a while now, about a decade, with my co-authors Joe Felter and Jake Shapiro and a small army of postdoctoral students and doctoral students and stuff like that. Two innovations in our inference. One, apply big data methods to counterinsurgencies. The other, really, find a way to use small data 
in a way that's consistent so that you're not writing a book about each case. You're pulling it together so you've got the power of numbers when you're making the arguments. And I'm over time, and so I'm going to cede right. to General Thompson. Thanks, Ellie. All right. Um, I don't know who's operating this thing to bring my... Before I start, let me just uh, introduce uh, Major General Retired Dean O'Milner, who's a classmate of mine from the Royal Military College, and followed me three tours after, right? As the commander of Canada's forces in, uh, in southern Afghanistan. Uh, Dino, you've recently retired. You're soon going to be suffering from what I suffer from, AHS, Acquired Helplessness Syndrome. So that all generals, re re especially retired ones, uh, suffer from. So I don't know how to use these things, as you can see. So it's going to be your job, Christian. Oh, Christian, sorry. When I say, next slide, please, sure. you advance the slide. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Should, should be up. There we go. So we're going to talk about the intersection of data and conflict here today. It's going to be a quick gallop through three very small case studies because I'm going to take a, a page out of uh, Ellie's, Ellie's book and talk about specific cases because it is specificity that matters. And in each case, I'll let you know what I thought I learned at the time because I, you know, you take away lessons from all of your different experiences. These aren't necessarily just war stories, uh, but rather there was uh, an opportunity here for me to learn something and apply it to my next mission. So all the slides you see on here for the most part are originals from that time because PowerPoint has been in the military since uh, 1905, I think. <laughs> uh, the rear view window or the rear view mirror look at these problems uh, will come out later and I will be discussing many of the conclusions that Eli, Eli has in his first book, Small Wars Big Data, because I didn't buy the second one, Eli, sorry. I hope it's not part of your pension plan. And, and while you will note that I believe numbers matter, I may not have drawn the right conclusion or the appropriate con conclusion at the time I made them. So uh, next slide. Here's the three, uh, wow, I might have to get a new aide de camp. Here's, here's, the, uh, here's the three case studies we're going to talk about. saint which is a small village just west of Kandahar City in, uh, in the province of Kandahar. Uh, the North Sinai, uh, specifically uh, El Arish in that area. Cluj in Bosnia. And uh, what, as it says here, what I should have done uh, in terms of small wars and big data. Next. So we'll start very quickly in saint -Gerre. Here's the orders that I gave, the, the, the operational philosophy that I gave my troops in, uh, in Kandahar province. And I did it deliberately in pencil and, there we go, in pencil and scanned it as a PDF and made sure it moved around that way because I wanted people to know this was my direction, not made up by some flat-faced staff officer because there's lots of those around. Uh, and as you can see, it, it, the, the, the crux in the upper right corner is the hold. Because when you think about counterinsurgency, clear hold build, which is the usual paradigm, in most of these situations, and uh, I don't think I'll have any disagreement here with Ellie, it's all about the hold. If you don't get the hold right, then you quickly lose the, uh, the, the population. And so uh, next transition, please. You'll see uh, lots of discussion at the time about getting the support of the population. Lots of discuss discussion about positively changing the perception of the population and challenging the insurgents' freedom of movement and all of that being done through the hold. And there's a whole bunch of other uh, things in here which uh, you might find interesting if you're a military person. Uh, but it also involves those elements of uh, development assistance that we were able to deploy. So that's what I was thinking when I went in. Next. Uh, and so here's what happened in saint -Gerie. Next. That's the village you see there that was circled and on that date Four Americans died in an IED, a complex, uh, complex attack, just outside of that village. It's the ring road that goes around Afghanistan. And those uh, four members, including the, the, the head of the uh, American police mentoring team, a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Jim Walton, died uh, on that occasion. So I knew I had a problem in the vicinity of San Jose Village. So what do we do next? We ran a quick clearance operation and we established a combat outpost here with Afghan National Army troops mentored by Canadian soldiers. So this uh, business about keeping your hand on them is very true. Six Canadian soldiers, 60 Afghans. And at the conclusion of that operation, I felt, you know, we had deepened the hold in the area of saint Jerez and we, we wouldn't have many more problems. Next. The next day, I'm sorry, back up one, just quickly. The next day, the guy down in the bottom right corner, his name is Habibullah Jean. 
He was the member of parliament from this area, friend of Karzai's, and the leader of the Alazai tribe. He was, he was murdered by the Taliban the next day for helping us uh, conduct this, this operation. Next slide. Uh, over the course of the summer and fall, we went through three governors. Uh, I already spoke about this guy's death. They, re they appointed his brother, who, uh, who was uh, you know, clearly much younger and not as competent. Mr. Karzai, the president himself, established a police force on the ground there, uh, based on tribal police, which is always problematic because you don't have direct control over, or, over them. And we had continued insecurity over the course of the summer and fall until next. That combat outpost here, on the morning of the 5th of December, con while conducting a route clearance patrol, uh, had an IED incident that killed three Canadians. And by the way, those three Canadians, Warrant Officer Wilson, McLaren, and, and Private De Pleros, were number 98, 99, and 100. So not only did I have three deaths to deal with, this was uh, a, big, a, a significant emotional event for the country. Uh, next slide. So here's what it looked like, because I'm going to explain how this happened. Uh, there's the ring road, big crater, no vehicle. Next slide. There's the vehicle. You can see it's turned over on its side. You can see uh, some people standing in the vicinity of it. Next slide. That distance between here and here is 32 meters. It's a 14-ton RG, what were they called, RG-34s? 31? Anyway, some number. Uh, and it flung it that far and killed those three guys instantaneously. So what were they doing driving down a road over a culvert? That's an obvious place to put an IED. Well, that, uh, that culvert had been cleared by a soldier looking in it before he called the, the vehicle forward. And he obviously missed something. So I, I knew I had a problem in that area, and it wasn't being necessarily assisted by that combat outpost. Next slide. Then the same thing happened eight days later. Another three Canadian soldiers died, and they died not even a kilometer away from where that, that other site was. Uh, next slide. And that's what that crater looked like. Picture taken by my, uh, my command sergeant major. And if you're military, the big, the big takeaway here is if the vehicle's not in the hole, it's not good news. So uh, uh, next slide. What we discovered, because again, this was, on, this was on another culvert, the next day is we found an IED on a different route that was inside of a culvert. But as you can see, they went in, they tunneled into the side of the, the culvert, and they placed the explosives there. Now, it takes an, an awful lot of homemade explosives to destroy an armored vehicle. Probably six of these large yellow jugs is what's typically used. And that kind of work is not something that you do in one night. It's probably a week or two weeks worth of effort. So that means that the local population is obviously aware of what's going on. Uh, and, you know, hearkening back to what Ellie was, Ellie was talking about, why wasn't that, in that huge, enormous village around which all these events were, uh, events were occurring giving us the tips that would have uh, prevented this from happening? And we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, next. Uh, here's what I thought I learned at the time next, apart from eating well. Uh, I had a human terrain team, and they mapped out the whole province in terms of human terrain. That's the village of saint Jerez, and you can see it's the biggest brown bubble, and that it's Alizai. It's an almost homogeneous village. So why is that important? Next slide. And I thought, well, it's important because here's the bits of the, uh, of the uh, Pashtun tribes that are on side with the government, and the bits in red are not. And look where they fall, the Alizai. And there's our friend Habibulajan. Even though he was in with the government, his people weren't necessarily. So you need to understand your environment. That's the first thing that I thought I learned. Next. Uh, I knew I had to measure effectiveness. And here, local polls matter. And as I've said to many people on different occasions, when I went into uh, Kandahar province, the level of insecurity felt by the population was around 20%. And when I left, it was at 40%. So clearly we were doing something drastically wrong because it was going downhill. You need to research the number, nature number of uh, security instances. So along that stretch of road, those are three IED events I mentioned. There were another eight that occurred in that general vicinity, which should have been a big clue. And you need to deliver, gee, reconstruction at, uh, at the local level that actually means something to people. And all of this was available at the time from a guy named Anthony Kordsman, who I think a lot of people know because he does a lot of research on these sorts of things. Uh, next. And here's an example of that useful development assistance being delivered to uh, our friend um, Haji Baran, who got, who got taken out. Was he still alive when you were there, Dino? 
Or was he already dead? Yeah, okay. Probably because he missed you. Uh, next slide. So uh, the third thing is the hold. And I've, I've spoken about this briefly. Here's a, you know, the geographic size of Kandahar uh, laid next to uh, Nova Scotia. Next slide, our transition. Here's the bits that we had. And here I've included the local troops, the Afghan troops, because they were, they were under our, I wouldn't say our control, but they were certainly under our direct supervision and we were able, able to use them to great effect, as were the Afghan police, because there were some 50 RCMP uh, officers deployed. So when you add all that up and you put it against a population of a million, what you're trying to get to is a ratio of 20 security force personnel, not just military, but 20 security force personnel for every thousand people in the population. Next. In my case, when I arrived in Kandahar province at the front end of 2008, that ratio was 6.8 to 1,000. And when I got an additional U.S. infantry battalion, it jumped up to a whopping nine and a half security force personnel for every thousand people. So clearly half the number of people I needed. And, uh, and I, you know, screamed and cried about that, but it got me nowhere. So that's what I learned at the time from uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan. Next. My three-year hiatus in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Sinai, this isn't about U.S. Or, or even allied troops, this is about the Egyptians themselves, is a classic example of where you have the right number of people, but the quality really sucks. Next. Here's what the countryside looks like in, in Egypt after the, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the ouster of Mubarak, and the complete um, collapse of the security situation in North Sinai. Next. Next. Next, next, that's the uh, road through, through uh, Rafa, right? Rafa's the, the town that borders on the, on the Gaza Strip. They cleaned out every building for, for within a, from within a kilometer of the Gaza Strip in order to avoid the tunnels. Next, and here they are digging the tunnels. And in the background, that's the Gaza Strip, right? So uh, no effort at all applied other than to completely crush them because they were applying what I would call a counter-terrorist strategy. Next. So here's an example of uh, a note that was dropped off at, go ahead, a note that was dropped off at one of our remote sites. I don't know if there's any Arabic speakers here, but I've, I've translated this for you. Next. And I'll just let you read that. So if that doesn't seem like this, a scream for, uh, like, this is an insurgency and we would really like to have, uh, uh, you know, our lives back, please and thank you, uh, I don't know what is. So, you know, perhaps it's a case where you apply a counterinsurgency strategy. Next. Um, numbers again, here's the casualty rate amongst the Egyptian security forces that they reported in their media, so there's, they could be somewhat suspect. And you can see between 2015 and 2016, and for those that don't know military abbreviations. WIA is wounded in action and KIA is killed in action. The trend isn't going in the right direction. And they're, they're, they're constantly taking casualties in, uh, in that area. Next. And you may be aware, this is after I left, that perhaps the worst terrorist attack in the Middle East occurred in the Sinai when they gunned down 305 people at a Sufi mosque, which is just west of El Arish. Next. So what's the lesson I retained at the time? Don't apply a counterterrorism strategy if you're in a counterinsurgency. So you need to recognize the, the, um, the conflict you're in. And what you see here, and the reason I use this cartoon, is because uh, that counterinsurgency, sorry, that counterterrorist strategy was being encouraged by the Israelis because the Israelis, and um, that's not an insult, they don't do counterinsurgency. Israelis do counterterrorism and they do it really well. They're not interested in winning over the local population in the areas that they're involved. Um, so basically that's what that's, uh, that points out. The issue is, of course, the Egyptian army is an extremely blunt instrument and not necessarily meant for this. Next. Uh, then I went to, uh, then I just want to finish up with going way back in history, at least in my time, 1996, with the NATO operation in, uh, in the former Republic of Yugoslavia. So I was in at the very front end, and that's what it looked like, pretty... Uh, Pretty cool, but this case is called, what happens if you actually have the right number of people and they're good quality? What I call quality density from top to bottom. So you've got good infantry at the bottom, 
well, we're not, never at the bottom, but good infantry is part of the mix and a whole bunch of uh, enablers that make things happen. Uh, you know, the UN failed in Bosnia. Let's face it, they failed. Several needs to happen. A whole bunch of ugly stuff happened. And so we went in, in uh, at the end of 95, early 96, with a, essentially a mission to deter, reassure, and assist the population. And what I like to tell people is, or ask people is, how many, how many NATO soldiers died on this operation in 1995, 96? due to direct action from the belligerents? And the answer is zero. It's remarkable what happens when you actually go in and smother the fire. Next. So the lesson I retained was quite simple. If you have a muscular intervention with, uh, with uh, which what's perceived to be overwhelming force and they're well resourced, you will not get as much pushback as you would if you went in half-hearted, which kind of, uh, and there, there's a, a number of assistance things that went on as well, and the political structure that NATO has is actually a bit stronger than what the UN might deploy. Right, next. So what I should have known, or what I could have known if had I had LA's book. Uh, so we'll start with San Jose, go ahead. Here's, uh, here, here's a slide taken right out of my package. I, I, was, I used to tell people, hey, you know, they're really sensitive about using their cell phones. This is written on a compound door, right, where they, where, where they were making IEDs, basically telling uh, the people that were working inside, don't use your cell phone because they'll find us. Next. And here's what uh, is written in the book that um, put out by uh, Small Wars Big Data. And it is true. It says here, you know, why did they only shut it off at night? Because they needed the phones during the daytime to coordinate their activities. But at night, they were concerned about tips. And there was a 1-800 number, so that, uh, what did you call her? The mom, that mom didn't make the call. And the reason, I think, I used to believe the reason she didn't make the call was because it's like you're here in Canada, and the Hells Angels rock up at your, up to your front door, and they demand to sleep in your garage, and you tell them to pound salt, and you phone the police, right? But here, if the, if the Taliban rock up at your compound and say, we're going to sleep here tonight, and, and, uh, and you're not going to do anything about it, you tend to be intimidated, because you're not convinced that making that call will make something happen. Uh, but it's true, we did manage to triangulate them next. And here is, going back to that IED incident I was talking about, and the cell that actually, that actually inserted that IED. This is the text from, a, from a, uh, an email I sent to my family on Christmas Day when I was sleeping in the Ashake Combat Outpost, which is where these guys were from that were killed on the uh, 5th of December. Um, and we got them on Christmas Day. It was perhaps one of the best uh, gifts I had. Killed 16 of them in Maywan District. And they were largely given away because they were picked up uh, using signals intelligence. So it is dangerous to use a cell phone in an insurgency. Next. Uh, and I just want to show this up because it talks directly to one of Ellie's uh, premises. Here's what we were told to do when we went over. Dean's probably got this memorized. Look at all that stuff. How much of that's military? Next transition. Just that little eeny teeny tiny bit. So one twelfth of our effort was actually the counterinsurgency. It doesn't even say conduct a counterinsurgency on there. But there sure was an awful lot of effort on repairing the Daladam, opening the schools, and eradicating polio next. And you can see that in his book, this is a great, great quote that I lifted out of his book, essentially says that uh, uh, if someone says Marshall Plan or ambitious infrastructure project, direct them to the exit, and if that fails, use it yourself. Well, sadly, when you're a professional officer, you can't run. Um, but it certainly kiboshes all the effort that was put into some of those projects in uh, Kandahar province. Next. Uh, but I was guilty of it as well, right? We had a paving project. We put 450 Afghan males to use in the uh, Zari Panjway district as a, in an effort to, uh, you know, employ 450 unskilled fighting age males in an effort to take them off the street. And it doesn't work. Next. And that's clearly pointed out by the study that Ellie and his people uh, did. You know, there's no, uh, there's no role of for aid in displacing insurgents, is essentially what it says there. And then next, in the North Sinai, I told them, hey, you know, the Egyptian officers I would talk to, you guys should read this book on modern insurgencies. It's a RAND study. It has 71, it studies, se it might be of use to you, I don't know, Ellie, because each one of them is done in a case study format. There are 71 individual insurgencies studied in here from the end of the Second World War. And it breaks it down into 24 concepts that you can use in an insurgency. And they were used 
they're not used exclusively, some of them are used together. Like, you know, you could have reform and democracy or uh, boots on the ground, and each of these is explained. But the one that doesn't work next, ever, is crush them. It doesn't work. And I certainly learned that in Egypt next. And it's reinforced inside of Ellie's book. Um, and it talks about the specific period, sadly, when uh, I was on the ground in Afghanistan, because after that, Dino got it all right. Uh, I don't think we'll sit here and read through all that. It, it basically says what I just mentioned. Next. And finally, you know, what's the conclusion from that small wars, big data for uh, NATO? Other than we needed new uniforms even back in 1996. Next. Uh, it's that for you need to have units with uh, superior small unit level leadership, like that guy in the picture, troops with high quality training, like most Canadian soldiers have, and doctrine, command and control measures that facilitate rapid innovation. I mean, and those are things that most Western militaries are known for. Uh, but they need to be there in sufficient numbers. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all I gotta say because I know uh, we're probably desperate to get to the questions. Next. Ellie, come on up. We'll start fill, fielding these. Uh. Thank you very much. That's good. Okay. You're taking all the questions, right? Uh, no, I don't do numbers. Any questions or comments? Chris. Hey, Mama. Well, Brad, I think I'd like to throw something out. Um, I, I agree that the counterinsurgency doctrine needs an update, and I think both of your uh, uh, discussions are really pertinent on it. But I'm wondering if uh, the big believer in the big data there. Um, but I'm not sure if what you put out might perpetuate our doctrine for the whole thing. And the idea of how we distinguish between what's actual development aid to build capacity versus what's humanitarian assistance. Because right now, uh, based on the data and sort of from your case study, it's a uh, squeaky wheel gets all the oil. So how we really distinguish what we're holding versus which can test it. And I tried to say Kandahar was contested versus Kabul up to Charan Par versus Murathari Sharif versus Herat, where it's actually held. And all the development aid, what goes down south versus what goes into those quiet areas where there's stability and security and predictability. So uh, that being the case, we're dumping money into places that are continually going to be contested. And therefore, the government's not building any capacity. It's all the aid's going into hotspot areas, those very quiet areas where they can actually get an economy going. So the government can build and then finance itself. And, but I think uh, we're just more prone to going into dumping money into these hotspot areas. No, you go ahead first because I think it's a, there's a general point there to be okay. made, and then I can uh, maybe talk specifically about I guess the bottom line is Afghanistan. Exactly what we're doing. What are we doing? So, so, so let me just address two, two pieces of that. There's an issue about the type of development assistance and there's an issue about the location of development assistance. In terms of the type of development assistance, you, know, you can do development assistance for lots of reasons. You can go inoculate kids so that they won't get sick. That's a good thing. Whether it helps with a counterinsurgency or not is unclear. It might be that the, the, the inoculation team gets extorted and, and you have to spend a lot of blood and treasure to get them out of there. Okay, or it might be that, that the rebels let them in and all, all is well. But in terms of type of development assistance that we know helps with a counterinsurgency, we'll just think about clear hole build and, that woman and, and the mom with the phone, right? If what you're giving is small enough that she understands what the purpose is and that it, it helps her, and it's conditional on her making phone calls, right? then it's going to help with the clear, it's gonna help with the hold, and when she's making this calculation about who wants to run her, who she wants to run her neighborhood, if you're committed to the build, then those are complementary activities, right? So if you need the development assistance to do the build, right, then that assistance is going to help you get the, get, get the tip, right? So that, all of that works in the context, now let's talk about location. 
all of that works in, a, in the context of a place where the local population has some faith that you or your local ally is, has, is, going, is committed to being there in the long term, right? That it's not going to look like Anbar, where the local government sometimes is there and sometimes is not. And in, in the Afghan context, I mean, and you've got two generals here who could speak to this and you know, certainly suffered more than I have in, in these places. Um, it's not clear to me if that's within the dotted line of the parts of Afghanistan that five years from now are going to be under the control of our ally or not. If it's within the dotted line, then everything that I said a moment ago makes sense. If it's not, then it's not clear why, what, what, what that drama was all about. Right, so uh, thanks Ellie. To, to talk specifically about Kandahar, because remember, my time, we didn't have sufficient resources to cover it all. And that's why the graphic shows the sort of the center of a district with disruption operations on the edge because what we're talking about here is, uh, where is it here? Sustain, sustain disrupt operations to define and shape the environment as part of the define, shape, clear, hold, build, and then enable. So we spend an awful lot of time, and you, you've seen this before, mowing the grass, right? That's what people do, they mow the grass. And I recall distinctly in, uh, on, on one of these operations with an Afghan National Army battalion, so I used to follow them around because I wasn't worried about my troops or even the U.S. troops that I had under command, uh, and, and, and a reporter in tow, and so we cleared this place out. And he turned around and he said, so, well, what happens now? I said, well, now we bring up the, the, uh, the police in a box, police station in a box, and we plant it here, and it's populated by Afghan National Police, and then we push on even further. He said, but sir, you don't have a police station in a box. He said, you're right. We're going to go back to our base, and we're probably going to be back here in about a month's time because we don't have enough people to put out all the fires. So you end up playing whack-a-mole. And, and, uh, and I guess the difference in terms of uh, development assistance, so, so and then when you clear a place for the sixth, seventh, or eighth time, you, you're not going to be welcomed anymore, are you? Right, they're so they're, they're pretty steady. That's, that's contested. Back oh no, I'm not. I'm not arguing with you. I, I, I think Kandahar is uh, is absolutely contested, and I haven't been there for ten years. Uh, Dino probably knows better than I what what state it is today, but I don't have a clue what what you know how it looks today. Um, and so we used we had our uh, Canadian equivalent of SERP that we used to try and to bring people along where we could, where we where we had a su su sufficiently large footprint. But a lot of those hundred schools which are outside, now you're talking about the USAID equivalent of aid being applied to build schools uh, that eventually just get burnt down, or in the case of Ashike, that combat outpost I was talking about, that's where the Afghan soldiers lived. They lived in the school, because it was the best piece of infrastructure. But where'd the students go? Uh, you know, so you're, you're, you're constantly fighting that, uh, that uphill battle. And in terms of humanitarian assistance, uh, there were a lot of programs, I don't know if it's humanitarian or not, for instance, to give out um, a grain seed in s to, to prevent people from growing poppies and then guaranteeing a price for them so that they would grow grain, get a guaranteed price instead of poppy, and run the risk of having their crop eradicated even if it did make 10 times more money. So I mean there's a lot of schemes out there and I'm sure you're aware of them all, uh, but it really, it is, it is all about, the, I'm, I'm a firm believer that it's, it's all about the local area. And if you can solve the problem locally, it, it may, you may not be able to take that model and then just pick it up and put it on the next district over. They're all, they're all different, and they all have their own tribal mixes, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you, you uh, so contested, yeah. You don't get any contest from me that it's not contested. John. Yeah, can I ask, at, at what point do you learn about the local area that you're talking about? And my experience in Canadian <coughs> uh, responses around Africa and experience seen from the comfort of the embassy and not from right. where you guys would work. <clears throat> over and over and over again, we can see that we don't know enough about what those factors are in each local area uh, where you're making these decisions, where you're trying to get aid and development on something that you think is necessary to back up what you want to do in, in the security plan. I, I think, um I think our mission specific training is what it's called in the, in the Canadian Army is actually spot on. So I'll give you an example in terms of we go out to, uh, I mean there's a bunch of individual training and then you do a big collective exercise as a task force 
in, uh, in our case in Wainwright, Alberta, and the, the training area is populated with what are called SIBs, civilians in the battle space. So they go out and hire a whole bunch of Afghan Canadians and stick them in the training area. Uh, and the guy who played the governor when I was, when I was training to go to Afghanistan was, was a gentleman, was a professor from the University of British Columbia named Vesa. Well, guess what happened? Like halfway through my tour, he got a call from, uh, from Afghanistan and he got sent to, to be the, the governor in Kandahar province. And when he got off the plane at the airport, he gets off the plane, they're all lined up there to meet him, Ahmed Wally Karzai, you know, Karzai's half-brother and all the, other, all the other notables in town. And at the end of the row is stuck, to, is stuck the NATO commander, me. And he goes down and he does all the, he shakes, shakes hands, et cetera, and he gets to me, he goes, oh, Dennis, and he gives me this big bear hug. And were they ever pissed off? Because <laughs> they figured they, they, that, that I was, or that he was in my camp. But um, I, I think we got uh, as good a steer as you can before you're actually on the ground in terms of af Afghan cultural uh, awareness. Uh, I would just have to add, add a, if I can, just a small piece. I think the, uh, you know, Canada was fortunate in Canada, our um, local knowledge, it, it grew with time. And um, with the numbers of troops that we had on the ground, we, Dennis had the entire uh, province of Canada. Uh, with the Serbs that went in with the Americans, uh, I then was given less uh, territory to the command. So I ended up, ended up with three of the districts. Uh, and I think that our knowledge of the people and what was going on within the, those districts um, extremely helped us uh, to, to then uh, figure out where the efforts needed to, to go. Um, the only challenge I would say is that the governance piece was always our biggest challenge. Um, the, the development side, I think, Yeah. Level yeah. Really had a bad like, like we were, like I mentioned, the you know cars are reaching in and creating a tribal police force in a village, because it's the way the place runs. It's, uh, yeah. you know. The last question goes to you. Okay. Um, so thanks for a very fascinating talk for both of you. Uh, so from an econ from uh, for an economist, this idea of a conditional aid to solve principal aging problems makes perfect sense. But from a practical perspective, how do you communicate that to the local populations? And secondly, uh, for, again, from because most of these places have, there's a diversity of ethnic and tribal divisions. So uh, in, in, in doing these kind of conditional aid or trying to do these policies, how do you navigate those divisions? For example, the thing that you mentioned that we hire 450 people to uh, pave, a, uh, pave a piece of road and create a job, uh, uh, create an employment opportunity. Do you leave that, who gets to select that? Because I'm thinking uh, maybe they're all then selected from a particular tribe or not and that may create additional uh, distortions because of that. You want to take the theory part of that and I can talk specifically about that project. Uh, so the, the yeah let, let me just I, let me just make one comment on the theory part. A lot of people walk into a place and say gee there's so many different ethnicities here and they don't seem to get along with each other. This looks like impossible territory. How could we possibly ever understand this well enough to govern it and 
and how could we possibly ever keep them from fighting with each other? You know, if, but it also begs the question, wait a moment, these, these different ethnicities have been here for two, three, four hundred years sometimes, right? Somehow they were getting along with each other up till now. So, um, you know, we tend to say, well, there's ungovernable space and there's governable space. You know, the northern Sinai is ungovernable space. Well, that's the choice of the Egyptian government. Western Pakistan is ungovernable space. Well, that's actually the choice of the Pakistani government. Southern Afghanistan, Kandahar, Helmand seems to look, looks like ungovernable space. Well, wait a moment. Those folks have been living there for a long, long time. They're about as diversely ethnic now as they used to be. Um, it's, they, there was some local political deal that allowed them to get along up till now. Um, why is it that we're not capable of reconstructing that deal? And why is it the Taliban seem to have access to a governance technology that allows them to control the space when we're still wondering whether it's controllable at all? Yeah, so practically speaking, I think, as I might have pointed out, hiring 450 uh, fighting age males was not a good idea. <laughs> uh, they were selected by the local district leader. And he was from the Nurzai tribe. We knew where, what his loyalties were, and, uh, and no doubt many of the people that he hired were uh, his, not his extended family, because most men couldn't generate 450 relatives. Uh, but he, and he certainly couldn't. Um, so uh, it's certainly a problem, but in terms of that reward business, if there's, a, there was a picture earlier of a sitting down having a shura with the local district leader and the woman in the shot. I don't know if we can bring that up real quick. Let's see here if I can operate this thing or not. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, she is a CEDA rep. So we actually had development uh, people in the field embedded with the military. Well, they're the experts. I'm not an expert in development assistance, but I do know that you have to give them there has to be an incentive for them to do it. So he would have been, he would not, he would have been promised uh, that road building project as long as he, you know, committed to something else, which was t typically governance oriented, like, uh, you know, we're going to hold a shura on a weekly basis. You're going to get all the village leaders together so that, so that you can conduct your business, but also so that we can pass our messages on from, from, uh, from our standpoint. So uh, that, that's basically it. Thank you very much. Uh, let me call on Christian Brief, who's the Deputy Director of the CIDP, to uh, thank our guest speakers today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. You're generous, as always, and it's wonderful Thanks. to host you again. Thanks, Christian. Uh, yeah. Dr. Berman, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talks, and it was, it's interesting having uh, served overseas as well myself, it's been, and some of these images are, are strike pretty close to home for me personally. Um, it's nice to get some explanation for sort of seeing what do you mean? He, what he was I in saw. the PRT. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Exactly. And I see so he was at one of those IED strikes for three guys from Golf Company uh, that would have been uh, like with that. yeah, with Christian, yeah. yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Fascinating. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.